G'day folks, this is Shane. Welcome to the In The Blues Tone podcast, coming to you from a very different angle. Usually I'm sitting in the center of this room. I have it pretty much set up for recording again tomorrow. I've had so many things come in that I need to do videos for, as well as a few shootouts that I want to do. And I've got stuff absolutely everywhere. So I'm sitting in a bit of a different, different spot. But the thing is, this actually might just be a much easier place to just shoot from. It's the same room, just a different angle. So hopefully it's all good. If you aren't watching on YouTube and you're just listening on the podcast, obviously it's not going to make much difference. But if you just want the audio form of this, head over to iTunes, type in In The Blues Tone Podcast or go to In The Blues podcast.com and it's free to listen to there just in audio form as well so we've got heaps of cool stuff to cover i think i'd start today with just letting everybody know what's going on with the sky music youtube channel so that was actually doing really really well we had 2,000 subscribers in the first month or just over the first month which was fantastic we later found out that there might have been a security flaw in the email address that we had attached to that account and being that I don't want to risk losing everything if that account has been compromised at all or if that email account had been compromised, it basically would have allowed access to not only the email account, but also the YouTube channel and, and a lot of other stuff as well. So we thought, you know what, let's kill that email account altogether and we'll start again. There was nothing wrong. Everything to do with the channel was moving forward and it's been really, really great. Uh, yeah, the only problem was what went on in the background. It felt like the easiest thing for me to do was to pull the email account completely and start fresh with a new one. So that's what we've done. And this way, both myself and Sky Music will have access to the back end and it'll be a whole lot more secure. It's limited access, but at least we've both got access and it should just be a whole lot easier for us to manage the site without any security concerns now. And yeah, so that's that's what's going on. We've got a lot of rumors saying, oh, I wonder if this happened or I wonder if that happened. Uh, no, it was just a safety precaution. I've had many years in IT and I know when to basically go, you know what, long term, I don't trust this. Let's start again, start scratch and start the right way. And we shouldn't have that problem again, fingers crossed. So all being well, uh, yeah, things should move along nicely. So what I plan on doing with that channel now, or what I am doing, two videos going up every single day, the ones that you've probably already seen if you are subscribed to that channel, or were. <laughs> and if you, if you don't know where it is now, I'll post a link up in the cards and you can check that out as well. But basically, two videos going up every day until we're back to where we were. And then I'll schedule the videos Tuesdays and Fridays, Melbourne, Sydney time, 8 a.m. So that's the plan. So moving forward, that'll be what's happening. So we'll get through all the other stuff just by two videos a day. Uh, we've already got a couple of hundred subscribers back, which is fantastic. So yeah, hopefully it does pretty well. We had a we had one viral video in that amount of time too, the Baja Telecaster one. And I, it's something I wanted to address on that. I called it the, it's infamous for a reason. So there's an old movie, I think it's from, from the 80s called The Three Amigos. Uh, if you don't know, if you haven't seen that movie, go watch it. Because that's my reference of infamous was more a tongue-in-cheek reference than it being a poor quality instrument. So if you haven't seen the three amigos go watch it it's well it was funny back in the day once we're back to where we were like i said two videos will go up every single week we're going to get together maybe monday and shoot some more videos that sky music have actually just got all of the new japanese fender stuff in as well so we'll have an exclusive couple of videos there i may actually bump a few of those forward as well i think it'd be a really cool thing we might even compare them to say the player series stuff which is somewhere around the same price. I need to get confirmation on that. But some of this new Fender stuff that's coming out is awesome. And yeah, so I'm looking forward to that. Rick's right into doing the videos too. He, he really, really loves it as well. So uh, yeah, everything's back on track and we should be back to where we were in no time at all. Next up on the podcast, I want to have a quick chat about the SX guitars and my experience with both of these. I bought a Telecaster, which is in my hands right now. And I also bought the Strat. And which one do I like the best? Believe it or not, I actually like the Strat. I like it because of its tone. Feel-wise, playability-wise, all that kind of stuff, they're both really, really great. I did have to just adjust the action slightly on both of them, so I brought the saddles down, and that was it. All in all, I'm gonna actually say that these are a better value instrument than the Squire Classic Vibes. Now, they might not have the headstock like the Squire. They might not have the by Fender part on the logo. I'm pretty sure that's on there. But if not, you know, it's a Fender product. It looks like a Fender product, even though it says Squire. And they're great guitars, man, the classic vibes. They're really, really good. These are so much cheaper in Australia. These are like about a quarter of the price or somewhere around there. And they're a whole lot more of just a great guitar for the price. Now, they're not like 
they don't supersede the classic vibe guitars in every aspect but just in terms of feel and tone and just the way that the necks are finished and all that kind of stuff these are just beautiful instruments i've taken these out and played live a few times one of the best tones i've had in recent times was with the strat it really made me play great a friend of mine got some uh, phone footage of it it's a little grainy and all that kind of stuff who knows how that happens in 2018 but if it's any good i'll post it on this video as well and you can see how it sounds but overall man the tone of these things are great i bought these to mod them but you know what i like them so much i don't think i'm going to be modding them long term I, I will be modding them just for video sake but i want to put everything back in when i'm done these pickups sound great in both of the guitars especially in the strat I had a chance to compare live my uh, Mexican standard Stratocaster versus the SX Strat. And the main difference was the Fender was slightly louder in terms of output, but wasn't quite as chirpy on the top end, which was an interesting thing as well. Sometimes with cheaper guitars, they kind of underwind a lot of their pickups, so you get more of a vintage sort of tone. The Strat is based on a 60s Strat. It's kind of got a pretty flat uh, radius as well, which was interesting. That was something that I didn't really uh, look at when I bought the guitar. When I bought it, I just said, have you got a Strat? I'll take it, because I got, did get a good price on both of these. So um, yeah, this is a really nice guitar, and if you haven't seen the videos of these, I'll, well, I actually, actually, I haven't shot the video of the Strat yet, but if you want to see the video of this, I'll put a link up in the cards and you can check that out as well if you're watching on YouTube. It's a really great instrument. Uh, I can't say enough good things about them. I want to get some good footage, hopefully this weekend. All being well, I'll take this camera and a couple of those little Behringer microphones and we'll see what sort of audio we can get and hopefully we can get some good footage too. If there's a few good players there, odds are we're going to get some good sound. Now, the cool thing is I got a text from my friend Alex who's been on my channel. He's a huge guitar uh, collector, trader, all that kind of stuff. He said, sent me a text message of a right-handed one of these today. He said he went down to check them out because the curiosity got the best of him after hearing mine live and he picked one up as well. So good on him for, for grabbing one. And uh, there's a bit of a community around these guitars and I always thought these were junk. I thought for years SX guitars were junk. I had a chance to buy one for 60 bucks a while back and I declined uh, because I thought they were just you know, POSs, <laughs> but uh, how wrong I was. I wish I had to pick that one up now, no doubt about it. So if you find these anywhere and they've got the finish on the neck like this, sort of like a vintage tint. Now the Strat does have a darker sort of tint on the neck. This series is awesome. I can highly recommend going to check them out. Uh, I, I did receive a lot of messages on YouTube and Facebook saying, I can't find these anywhere now on in Australia. So I don't know if the video had something to do with that or whether a lot a lot of shops were just out of stock. But um, yeah, they're very, very cool guitars. Made in China, feel great, sound like a classic vibe, feel like a classic vibe with a slightly fatter neck, which I like, but uh, for a whole lot less money. So if you can live with the headstock looking a little bit different 
uh, which I can. I actually think it looks pretty cool. Uh, I think you're going to like these guitars, so check them out. All right, up next, I wanted to have a quick chat about the Fret Zealot, which I had a review scheduled for, but I'm holding off because after chatting with the company, they told me that the unit I got must have been defective, and I'm going to explain a little bit about this. Now, if you follow me on Instagram, you'll know the first day I was loving it, and the second day I wasn't. So if you don't know what this is, it's essentially like a strip of LEDs that you put or stick onto your fretboard, and then it's powered by this little battery pack slash Bluetooth receiver. And then you fire an app up on your phone and you can sort of scroll through the scales and all the lights would come up on the fretboard. It's a really awesome system. I love the concept of this when they said, hey, we'd love you to check it out, do you mind? Give us an honest review. I said, absolutely, send it out and I'll check it out. And the first day was good. I got it on there fine and it worked. Second day, it didn't work. Second day, it very rarely worked. And it was the day that I planned on filming it. So I spent one full day with it and had its glitches, but it was okay. The second day, it, it was terrible. It stopped working altogether. So uh, I put this review together, actually on camera trying to film it. Nothing was working. <laughs> and that was the review. I, there was a lot of this. Look, there's still a lot about it I don't like, but the concept is awesome. And after emailing back and forth with the company, they said it has to be faulty. It shouldn't be dropping out like it was. So the Bluetooth connectivity was dropping from the phone to the receiver. The LED lights weren't changing when you change scales, all that kind of stuff. Some of the lights on the strips weren't actually lighting up either, which was, this was only on the second day. The first day, everything worked great. The guitar wasn't dropped or misplaced or mishandled or anything like that. So it was odd that the second day it stopped working. So the item must have been faulty. I'm gonna give these guys the benefit of the doubt. They said they'd send out another one. Now, if this one does exactly the same thing, the review they're gonna get is gonna be brutally honest and it's gonna go over the pros of the thing, but would I recommend it in its current state with the two days it took for it to die? Absolutely not, but I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt as well. So if it was just a faulty item, the next one turns up and it's fine, I'll re-review it, but I'll also make mention of the first product that came in that didn't work. So hold off on that review. If you have been following that on Instagram, I basically told just warn people don't buy this thing because you know it only took two days 48 hours before it died <laughs> which was crazy it didn't get wet i followed all their instructional guides and everything on there on youtube to uh, install it and i really like the concept of it but as a gu guitarist and not just a straight up beginner there's th certain things about it that i don't like Anyway, even if it was completely functional, there's a few things about it that I don't like. But the positives would would have outweighed the negatives had, had it have worked properly. So I'm still willing to give them the benefit of the doubt and the new item should be coming soon. So that review that I was gonna post, which was pretty negative on the most part, I, you know what, I thought about it. I said, you know, stuff can break in the mail. Send out another one. If I have the same experience, I'll let you know. And if it's a better experience, like I said, I'll, I'll share that obviously with you as well. So stay tuned for that. That's the Fret Zealot. It'll be coming up soon. So you might remember a little while back, I actually got a chance to review the Fender Blues Junior version four and the Pro Junior version four as well. Both of those amps are awesome, but I was really waiting to try the DeVille and the Hot Rod Deluxe. I love both of those amps. I've owned a few Hot Rods over the years, whether it be a DeVille or an actual Deluxe. And they're really, really great. I still own a Fender um, Blues Deluxe back there as well. But these new Hot Rod Deluxe amps might be some of the best Fender amps I've actually ever played. And I'm gonna tell you why. They finally, Fender, thank you. <laughs> they finally got the drive channel to work properly and to sound great. Now, some people might have already liked the prior generation drive channels in those amps but I think it's a combination of a slight revoicing of the drive channels mixed with really, really good speakers. They finally put those Celestion A-type speakers in, or just anything better. It's probably heavily inspired by that Landau amp, but both the, the DeVille and the Hot Rod Deluxe are some of the best amps I've played. Would I consider buying either of them? Absolutely. I actually really wanna get the Hot Rod. It's a plug and play amp, much like my Marshall DSL 40 CR, has a great, Clean channel, you can use all your favorite pedals. That yellow channel, which was kind of like the better of the two in my opinion, sounds really great. It's nice and round on the bottom end. I'm sure some people out there really love the sound of the old drive channels on those amps, but now 
it's not even close. They sound like a whole new amplifier. And I'm sure a big part of that has to do with the upgraded speakers as well. Those Celestian A-type speakers are just really, really nice sounding speakers. I uh, actually even love the V-types as well that they're putting in some of the Marshalls. I think they're both really great, really efficient speakers. They're loud and they capture a pretty great sound when you play live as well. They really poke out of the mix. These new drive channels are just fantastic. So the drive channel kind of takes off where the clean channel would almost end. You don't lose much low end, which is fantastic. I didn't really notice it, with the DeVille especially any major loss in low end. It just sort of felt like the off clean tone you've always wanted, which is great. Now, the interesting thing is on the old DeVilles and all that kind of stuff, the red channel was the one that you used to avoid because it kind of got a little bit fizzy. The gain was probably a little too high for most people as well. Uh, not everybody, obviously. There'd be, be people that would use it out there. For, but for playing blues, that channel was just... It wasn't very pleasant to the ears. You could kind of get a good sound out of it if you had the master volume up really, really loud. But anywhere else, it just didn't seem to sound as good. Now, this red channel on the new amps feels a little bit like what the Blues Junior has. It feels like a fat boost. It is adding a little bit more gain, which is fine because the yellow channel doesn't have a whole lot of gain. But it actually sort of fattens the mids and just voices it really, really beautifully. This is something completely different for the Hot Rod Series amps. And could I see myself owning one down the track? Absolutely. This would be at a total plug and play amp. It may actually replace my Blues Deluxe, which is kind of scary. I might keep the Blues Deluxe. I've, you know, last time I, I sold my Blues Deluxe, I, I lasted maybe a year and then I went, oh man, I missed that amp. So essentially, it's that kind of quality on the clean channel, but then you get those actual usable drive channels, which I'm just not used to with Fender amps other than the Supersonic. There's a few out there that do it really well, but this new amp, this, they, this new series of amps, Fender have actually finally done it right. If you've had a chance to play one or you own one, let me know in the comments. It gets the thumbs up from me. All right, up next, I wanted to have a chat about going direct into a sound card or going straight into a PA system. Now at home here, I've got the luxury of a couple of different devices to allow me to record. Uh, recently, we did a gig at a place called Paddy's Tavern. Actually, we've been playing there for about six months now, on and off every other month or something like that. And last time, we decided we weren't going to take any amps in. We were going to go straight to the PA system. And the reason is twofold. One, the stage is tiny. <laughs> Two, there's tables right at the edge of the stage. So if you've got your guitar amps right up the front, which is the only place you can put it, it you know, you're basically chopping people's heads off. You do play to the room, obviously, but even so just with acoustic drums and a bass, you kind of still need to get over that, even at lower volumes at the start of the gig anyway. So we decided, you know what? We're gonna go direct to the PA system. Now, my friend Brian had his Joyo American Sound pedal out. Now, I've been a huge advocate of that series of pedals for a long time, and I actually took that GE200. Now, I noticed some pros and cons of both of these units. Well, of one of these units. The GE200 is amazing for recording at home, for just doing tracks and all that kind of stuff, it's fantastic. It's probably the best all-in-one inexpensive device you can get. Brian actually had the Joyo American Sound pedal on the floor and he used all of his regular pedal board with it going into it and then straight out to the PA. They both sounded great. But you know what? It's really good when you're doing a gig to still have that analog functionality of crouching down on the floor, turning a control by hand and just getting more or less of whatever you wanted to dial in at that particular moment and also being very familiar with the effects that are on the floor. Now that GE200 is going nowhere. I'm gonna use it all the time, whether or not I'm doing live streams on YouTube, whether I'm recording, and I'll still take it to the jam night. I've got a really great preset dialed in, but you know what? I ended up with one of these, and I know the people who are just listening to the audio can't see this, but it's an American sound pedal. But what is it? It's something a little bit different. Now, this is by a company which I've dealt with them before, and I, I got to be honest, I don't really like the people that reached out to me at all. They were they were pretty rude. But this is from a company called A Moon A M M O O N. So A double M for Mary, O O N for November. And this is basically like a rebranded American Sound pedal. But you know the difference between this and the American Sound pedal. 15 bucks, <laughs> so these are much cheaper. I think I paid $35 for this. Uh, I'll put links in the description if you wanna check it out. 
So I'm back with one of these for now. I'd also like to borrow the Joyo American Sound off Brian. I think I either gave mine to him or I gave it to Rick. I can't remember. So anyway, what I'll do, I'll do a comparison between both of them. You know what? This does feel a little bit different. The pots feel different, which may lead me to believe this might be a copy of a copy. <laughs> so for those who don't know, Tech21 were the actual innovators of these. And if you don't know what this is, essentially it's basically like an amp simulated pedal. It's completely analog. You can run your pedals into it and then run a line out into the PA system or into your sound card and just get amazing results. So these are really cool. You can have it voiced like a, a Fender Deluxe Reverb or a Twin or whatever, just using the voice control in the center. You can get pretty much anything from the tweed sound all the way through to you know your classic Fender tones. And they just work great and they're a great investment. And like Brian said, Leave one in your bag when you go to a gig in case your amp stops working and then you've got a great backup source. And I was like, you know what? That's a fantastic idea. Even if I only use it from time to time, it'll be my bag and we'll do the next gig with a couple of these on the floor and we'll see if we can also get some footage. Filming at that particular place is a little bit hard because like I said, the tables where people eat are right next to the stage. There's nowhere to really leave a camera there, which kind of sucks. But I might ask a few of my friends just to see if they can get some uh, better quality sort of phone footage. And we'll see if we can actually get something that you guys can see and see how it sounds. But I use these on albums. My last, well not my last album, but the one before that, The Change I Need, we used all of our, had all of our guitar tracks going through these with a reverb pedal after it and whatever effects we wanted before it. And it just, it was so good. You know, we had a great selection of amplifiers to choose from. We mic'd them all up. This sounded better and it was less loud and all that kind of stuff. So we decided this was the way to go. If you are watching on YouTube, I'll leave some links below so you can check this out. So like I said, this is either a rebranding or a copy of a pedal called the Joyo American Sound, which was a copy of a pedal called the Tech 21 Blonde. So if you want to buy, if you want to go to the top and buy the original, get the Tech 21. If you can't afford that and you like Joyo, buy the Joyo. If you want to save even more money, buy this like I did. So, uh, yeah, video demos to come up of this as well. I'm gonna mix it up with the demo that I do and sort of cover as much as I can with this. Because there's a few ideas I think this thing could, there's a few things I think it can do which I might not have covered in the past. So stay tuned. Now I know a lot of the people that watch the channel love inexpensive pedals and effects. I love them too. And when I find great ones, I like to share them with you. So I'm gonna share three with you right now that I think it's definitely worth checking out. Now, I've got to say up front, these aren't the most innovative pedals ever, but for their price and how great they sound, they're definitely great. And videos of these will be coming out pretty soon. So I had so many people ask me about this. This is the Pegasus Overdrive pedal from Kalen. This is based on a Klon. They're around 50 bucks, something like that. It might be the most affordable Klon out there. If you've been a fan of the channel for a long time, and you've been subscribed for ages, you'll know that I, I stand behind Kalen stuff. I haven't had one of their units turn up at the house dead on arrival or anything like that. And I must have reviewed at least 30 of them. So Kalen, a very similar quality, maybe slightly better to some of the Joyo stuff, maybe not all of it, but it's that kind of build quality. It's a nice big box, it looks cool, and it sounds like a clon. So that's the first one that I wanted to share with you. Uh, and design wise, they've finally sort of updated the graphics on the pedal. That's one of those things that doesn't mean a lot to some people, but visually that's very appealing to people to have a pedal that actually looks good. This next one from Kalen's definitely really cool as well. It's called the Ghost Rain Reverb Delay. Now it's not a reverb and a delay, it's more like an echo delay. So like an analog sort of sound and it does it extremely well. The graphics look great as well. I'll try and overlay some stuff on screen here. I should have some B-roll left on my computer. So yeah, this definitely looks and just, it looks cool, but it sounds unreal. So that, that would be the two that I think really stand out from this new batch. This next one's called the Kalen Midlander. Now it's green and it's got three controls. So what is it? It's a tube screamer in a different box. Well, a very similar box. It's like a Maxon OD808, something like that. And man, it sounds great. It sounds awesome with the Pegasus, so you can stack this. That was basically my favorite combination of pedal for a long, long time. Running a Klon into a Tube Screamer. Together, they sound great. So you can pretty much replicate one of my favorite tones of all time for under 100 bucks. Now, I don't sell these. These aren't going on my website or anything like that. These are just ones that were sent to me from Kalen to test out. I'm like stunned. I've been able to test a compressor 
And there's a few others over here. There's one that's also an OCD style pedal as well. There's a, you know, there's a few fuzz pedals. I'm not a huge fuzz pedal fan, but the new pedals look and sound great. And it's interesting that they've sort of gone with sort of replicating some of the classics. I love the fact they've done the Pegasus slash Klon. And you know what? I always wondered why none of these cheaper pedal companies, why don't they ever copy the full tone plimsoll? I don't know if it's just a complicated pedal to copy or what, but I'm surprised no one's actually bringing that out. So if anyone from Kalen's watching this, see if you can hook that one up. I reckon that would be great. They're a really cool drive pedal. I just don't see too many clones of them floating around. I see plenty of OCDs. I see plenty of tube screamers, all that kind of stuff. Um, but at least the cool thing about this is they've rebranded them. They're not calling them Tube Screamer. They're not calling it Clon, Pegasus. And it made me wonder too, like how many names could possibly be left to relabel a Clon? Like Pegasus, Tumnus, all that kind of stuff. It just makes me wonder how many, uh, how many terms, uh, uh, mythical beasts or whatever could they have left? I don't even know what a Pegasus is, I don't think. I don't think it's an actual, uh... I don't know. If you know what a Pegasus is, let me know in the comments. But either way, the new range of Kalen stuff might be some of the best inexpensive pedals that have come through in a while. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for those videos. They'll be coming up soon. So I've actually got some pretty cool news coming up in late August, early September. So about the first week, about eight days all up, nine days, something like that. I'm actually taking a break. So I won't be around. I won't be answering comments. I won't be uploading any new videos. I'll probably have some videos scheduled for the week I'm away. Uh, that's usually how I like to work anyway. I used to usually have a few weeks ahead of time scheduled. But that said, I'm going to take some time off and I'm actually going to Copenhagen or Copenhagen, however you want to say it, over in Denmark to meet a friend. And this is something that we've been putting off for many, many years. And it was like, if we don't do it this year, we might not get a chance to do it next year. And then we might have to wait another 10 years. So you know what? Let's just do it. The whole YOLO thing. You only live once. So I thought, you know what, it's a good time for me personally to get over there and just take a break and get some downtime and all that kind of stuff. I've been so busy with everything that I do, both between my In The Blue stuff, my actual Sky Music YouTube channel as well, and just everything else in between. It's been really, really busy and crazy. So a week off will be, will be awesome. Now, I love being busy. I don't mind hard work. I, as you can see, I post almost daily content as well, and I try to keep the standard up. But just to unwind and have some fun in a country I've never been before will be amazing. So what's the second part to this? So I'm actually only going to be there for a week. I come home and then a month later or so, give or take four weeks, I'm actually going to GitCom with Dr. Rick. Now, I was invited and I didn't want to go. And Rick talks me out of not going. And he said, you should go. There's going to be a whole lot of great guys there. And Lewis as well. And Steve and those guys also said a few things. But Rick was the main guy. He seemed more excited about it than I was. And I said to him, how about, you know, you've helped me for years on my channel. How about if if I can see if I can get you a ticket? Now, I didn't realize they were going to fly me business class over there right until later. But I found that out and I said, you know, is there any chance Rick can come? And he goes, oh, well, you won't be able to fly business class. So I was like, oh, I didn't realize I was. So anyway, we're both going. So both of us are heading over. Now, the cool thing about us going over there, we're not fanboys of any of those brands. Like, I don't like Hughes and Kettner. I don't know anything about Warwick and Framus. They're not like guitars and brands that are on my radar uh, at all. And not to belittle the brands, I, I'm just not that interested in them. I've never, you know, it's not a brand I see around. It's not a brand I go after or anything like that. So whatever we sort of review, if we choose to review something, we're not forced to do anything. Uh, it's going to be like, these are our impressions of it. And if we don't like something or if Rick blows it up, that's going to be the review. He's great at doing that, actually. If you want your amp destroyed, just give it to Rick and he'll turn it up and destroy it for you. So we're going to go over. I was way more comfortable going over with someone I knew. And after checking out the guest list this year, I thought, yeah, this is going to be the year. I don't know if something like this is going to continually go on every other year or every year. And I don't know if I'll get another chance to go. You never know what's coming up. So I thought, you know what? This will be the year of opportunity. I'm going to Denmark for the first time, going to Germany for the first time. And whatever videos we come up with is what we shoot there. There's no pressure or obligation to review anything. And that's kind of what I liked about it. And I'm pretty comfortable with everyone that's going to be there too. I think it's going to be an awesome experience. Some of the guys I've wanted to meet who I've been talking to for a long time, you know, via email or on the live streams and all that kind of thing. So yeah, I was wondering how the attendance was going to look, but it actually looks like it's going to go ahead 
and it's going to go ahead really, really well. Judging by who's confirmed already, it should be a pretty cool event. I'm actually looking forward to the live jams the most. Maybe we can bust out a slow blues on stage and it'll be streamed to whoever streams at the uh, GeekCon channel, I guess. I never really watched much of it last year. So, uh, and I know there's a whole lot of drama around that with people getting removed from the event, but you know what? They always say there's two sides to every story. I'm not saying someone's in the right or wrong. I don't, I'm not informed enough to know about that, but let's just say I'm comfortable with going. I think it'll be the year I go. I don't know if I'll do it again, but I think just as a one-off experience, it's definitely going to be fun. And being that Dr. Rick's going to be there as well, we're going to have some fun. And it's great for me personally to be able to thank him and repay him for all his hard work. He doesn't really need much other than more telecasters in his life. So um, yeah, it, it's good that, you know, it's worked out that we can both go. So I think that's a really cool thing. So something interesting came to my attention recently. I was talking to Dr. Rick about this and I thought I'd pose the question to you guys to see what you kind of think. Now, this isn't to belittle this guy at all. He's one of my favorite players in the world. He's arguably the greatest hybrid picker. You know, if you don't know what that is, it's like holding a pick and using your fingers at the same time. And he flies around the fretboard. Johnny Highland, a monster, monster player. Seems like a lovely guy. But it seems like every other year he's got a new signature guitar or a new set of pickups with a different company. So this isn't to belittle Johnny Highland. This is more to ask the question of why or how does he keep getting bounced around all these other companies? Or do you think he's actually doing it? Maybe the pay's better at one or the other, other company. I'm not too sure what it is. But it's interesting that he goes around from company to company as often as he does. And I've noticed on his videos, he kind of says exactly the same thing. These pickups are exactly what I wanted. I actually owned a couple of his pickups from D. Allen years ago, where I heard the same thing. He sort of endorsed those for a while, and they were his signature ones. Then he went across, I think, to PRS at that time. Then he went to uh, Ernie Ball, I think it was. And now he's with Kiesel Guitars, basically playing a Telecaster with three pickups. And I don't know why he just doesn't play Fender. I mean, obviously, Fender aren't probably aren't going to endorse him or whatever. I don't think they do the same sort of endorsements they used to do. Johnny's like arguably one of the best at what he does in the world. He's an absolute monster player. It just, I always wondered, how does this happen? How does an artist bounce between companies every other year? Look, it might be three years between companies, but I mean, I've seen him play all of his custom guitars in different videos and sort of you know promote them at NAMM and all that kind of stuff. I'd love to meet the guys. Like I said, f fantastic player. But I find it odd. He's one of the few guys that I see that is always bouncing around companies. Like he'll go from one to the other to the next. Uh, and I just I just find that a little bit odd because, I don't know, do people lose trust in artists that sort of promote something for a long time and then all of a sudden they don't? Or even YouTubers for that example. But I guess it's different because we get lots of stuff in. If you put your name on something, that's, that's where it's a little bit different in my mind. So... I don't know, man. I, how long do you think Johnny Highland's going to last at Kiesel Guitars? Two years? <laughs> Let's see if there's something around 2020 where he brings out another model from a different company. I know he also plays a whole lot of other tallies and stuff made by other art, by other um, builders that are other than Fender. So I don't know what his relationship is with Fender, if anything. But yeah, I just find it odd that every other year there's a new set of pickups with a Johnny Highland name or a new guitar, or whatever. He's a phenomenal player. He should be able to just walk into somewhere and say, hey, I'm Johnny Highland, hook me up and get the guitar that he really wants. Because if he's going back to a Tally style guitar from Kiesel, you'd think he'd probably, you know, be at home on a Sur or a Fender or whatever. Yeah, so not to say that Kiesel don't make great guitars. I've never actually picked one up, but I kind of find it a little sad and maybe a little bit odd that he's one of the few guys I see every other year. Well, it feels like every other year. Like I said, it might be two years, might be a year, it might be three years, but since I've been following Johnny Highland, he's changed guitar manufacturers a number of times and put his name on it. So let me know in the comments. Like I said, this isn't to belittle Johnny Highland. What do you think the reason for this is? Do you think it could be a financial incentive for Johnny from the company? Or do you think that the companies might not be actually looking after the artists like Maybe he thought they would. It's an interesting thing. I'd actually love to shoot him an email and find out exactly what's going on. So yeah, like I said, phenomenal player. Some of the best solos I've heard are with Johnny's playing. And actually a really cool video that started this train of thought for me. I was actually sent a video from Rick of Johnny Highland playing uh, one of the new Chapman Telecasters. 
and you know it's a tally with a different neck and johnny man he's just he just rips the crap out of it like he plays so good and i think rob's just there with his you know he's got his jaw open just blown away he's, i think he said to him man you're the best guitar player i've ever heard and i i uh, totally agree so this isn't an actual dig at Johnny. I love his stuff. I love his music. He's a fantastic player, amazing talent, one of the best in the world. But what brings this upon artists to bounce around companies like this? I, I find it a little bit odd. Now, I know we all go through phases where we like different styles of guitars. But yeah, I, I would just, I don't know. It's just a bit odd. So let me know in the comments why you think this happens. And are there any other artists that bounce around companies as often as Johnny? There's, there's bound to be some out there, absolutely. But I can't think of anyone who's changed guitar companies like three or four times in like eight years. Seems a bit odd. So let me know in the comments. And that wraps up the In The Blues Tone podcast for July 2018. My name's Shane. If you aren't subscribed already on iTunes or any podcasting software, head over and type in In The Blues or Tone Podcast and it should come straight up. It's definitely gaining a lot of momentum on iTunes as well. So thanks to everyone who listens on there. I really appreciate it. I do try to get one of these out every month, but sometimes just due to the amount of stuff I have come in, it's not always practical, but I do plan on trying to do one a month at least up until the end of the year. I want to give a huge shout out and thank you to all the Patreon subscribers, as well as BV, who has just also participated in pretty much the top tier on Patreon now as well to support the show. So all these special guys and gals with their names on screen thank you so much for the support if you want to head over to patreon i do give away backing tracks that you hear on the channel as well as also offering pedals and all of the x demo stuff to the patreon subscribers first so that's some of the benefits of being involved over there thanks again for watching thanks again for listening my name's shane i'll catch you soon see ya